Turn to number 544. Sing all four verses.
them to worship the only one who is worthy of our worship. We're going to talk about true salvation in just a minute as we finish up chapter 12 and see Jesus' sort of final words and invitation to the Pharisees and those who have rejected him. Uh, in two weeks, August has five Sundays, so we've got one more Sunday in August, but uh, two weeks from today, we're going to have the Lord's Supper uh, here on September the 6th, and then on September the 13th, we'll have our business meeting after the service. So uh, we did that in June and thought it worked pretty well, so we'll uh, do that again after the service on the um, 13th. And I think that's all I have as far as an announcement. Anybody? Oh, yes, the magazines for September, and I'm glad you said that because it reminded me of something else that I've been meaning to announce and I forgot. Um, if you notice, we have a tapestry. Daniel says he always thinks of Indiana Jones with the tapestries, but anyway, um, there is a, a tapestry at the back that Valerie donated to the church, and we finally got it uh, fixed up, and uh, we had some logistics issues, and we've got that fixed now. So um, the scripture doesn't say specifically that the angels sing, but we tend to think of them singing. So either way, it should be a place of praise, and we thank Valerie uh, for that. All right, anybody else? All right, big hug. <laughs> Twenty-nine. We'll sing all three verses. Certainly one of those that we uh, 
maybe you've read before and wondered what in the world did that mean. Uh, we're going to begin reading with verse 43 and go through the end of the chapter. Jesus, really, this is kind of a turning point. Um, it's amazing when you put it all together how it works. Chapter 13, we're going to start on the parables of Jesus. And the disciples ask, why are you speaking in parables? And the reason is, he says, because these people have rejected me, and I'm speaking to you so you can understand, and they won't understand because they've chosen to reject me. Well, the first 12 chapters tell all the information they got, and they still rejected him. And so in chapter 13, we see a change. Chapter 16, we'll see another change as with Peter's confession as we move toward the cross. Uh, almost half, not quite half, but almost half of the Gospels deal with the last week of Christ. And so we'll look at that as well in Matthew. Uh, so, Matthew chapter 12, um, the Pharisees have said Jesus is casting out demons by demons. They ask for a sign. They've rejected Christ. And so Jesus gives them an illustration. Really, um, that would have been a good outline. Uh, an illustration and then an invitation at the end. All right. Verse 43, chapter 12. When an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out, and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it also even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and brethren stood without, desiring to speak to him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak to thee. But he said unto them that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us and help us to rightly divide it. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored and that we would worship you in this time of study and proclamation of your word. Glorify yourself in our presence, Lord. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus has really told the people, the pagans will judge you because they believed and you didn't. And then he describes, as I said, an illustration of what I called the danger of reformation. We have... Uh, in this, well, I don't think we have that anymore. I started to say, well, we used to have, this was back in the 80s, the moral majority. Is anybody old enough to remember that? And they stressed the importance of doing what was right, doing what was moral. And that's good. I'm not against that. But there is a danger in it. And that's what Jesus talks about. Did you ever think there was a danger in being good? Adrian Rogers said something like this, it's not verbatim, the worst evil is not man's wickedness, but man's righteousness without Christ. In other words, I'm okay by myself. I'm good enough. I've turned over a new leaf in Jesus' illustration. This evil spirit had gone out of the man. I mean, he had changed. He had gotten better. He made a change outwardly. But only God 
can make a change inwardly. The evil spirit was cast out in this case, possibly even by Jesus. The spirit, or the, we'll say for our purposes, this bad habit that this man had, he quit. But the evil spirit is still looking for a host. When Jesus cast the demons out of the swine, you remember? They asked, let us go into the pigs. Don't just cast us out. Our bad habits, our demons, I'm not minimizing that. I do believe they are evil spirits in the world. Um, I may have worked with some over the years, but anyway, <laughs> uh, that's a different sermon. Uh, there are evil forces, but we would get in trouble by ourselves without them. I know I've told you the story about the little girl and she was in a fight with her brother and she punched him and she kicked him and she bit him. And her mother said, honey, don't you know that the devil makes you do that? She said, well, he may have made me punch him and kick him, but biting him was my idea. <laughs> so we can change outwardly, but only God can change us inwardly. Not only can we change outwardly, but we can clean up. We can do better. We can't be godly, but we can be better. Have you, well, you can clean up. You can get rid of a bad habit. Homer and Jethro used to say, I don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls that do. And sometimes that's as far as our righteousness goes, our outward righteousness. We have a list of things that we don't do. Not only is it a list of things that we don't do, but we keep a list and watch to see that others don't do our list if we're rules keepers. They're breaking one of my list. You can be changed outwardly. You can even be cleansed outwardly and still not be right with God. There is that danger of self-righteousness. Even if Jesus cast out the demons, one of, I don't know that it's a good story, but it's a a convicting story. The Bible says that there were ten lepers that came to Jesus and they said, heal us. And Jesus said, okay, go show yourself to the priest. And that's a beautiful story if you look at Leviticus. The illustration of what a leper did when he was cleansed and the sacrifice he made is a beautiful picture of Christ with the two birds. The, they killed one bird and kept one bird alive and it's a beautiful picture of the death and resurrection of Christ. And Jesus said, Go show yourself to the priest and do that sign that shows me and you'll be healed. And the Bible says as they were going, they realized they were healed and one of them turned around and came back and fell at Jesus' feet and thanked him for, well, not for saving him, but for cleansing him. He came back to Jesus. And Jesus said, and this is the convicting part, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger. He was a Samaritan. He was the one that wasn't even supposed to come back. And Jesus said, and this is the difference, the other nine were cleansed outwardly, but Jesus said to him, Arise and go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. So there's a danger in just reformation, in sweeping up, in cleaning out, in changing. And Jesus said the catastrophe of that is the last state's worse than the first. You can... And if you've tried to do this apart from Christ, I think you can identify. 
I won't ask you to raise your hand. I think maybe we've all done it before, tried to change. Outwardly, Jesus said this evil spirit goes out and finds seven others worse than himself. And they go back and they find, find the place cleaned out and they sit down. They dwell there. The same word is used in Ephesians 3 where Paul says that Christ, his prayer is that Christ may dwell in the heart of the Ephesians. Self-righteousness debilitates. It deceives us that we think we're okay now. And we're really not. The other bad thing about self-righteousness is it disseminates. It spreads. Have you ever noticed how evangelistic false religion is? I mean, well, well, I'm just going to plow sort of close to the corn here. Have you ever noticed how evangelistic Jehovah's Witnesses are? Or Mormons? They love to get out and tell the story, and it's the wrong story. Jesus told the Pharisees, you go out, cross sea and land to make one convert, and you turn him into twice as son of hell as you are. Pharisees were self-righteous and they tried to spread it. And finally, self-righteousness damns us. It's, well, one of the reasons I believe, and I have not been, but just from the stories they tell, of um, Bob Clater going to Africa, when you preach to the African people there in East Africa, I think it is. I always get my sides mixed up, get it on that far side. Um, and you tell them that they're sinners and they need to be saved. They agree with you. They don't have somebody telling them they're good like we do. They know they're sinners. But us. I mean, look at where we live. Look at where we work. Look at the kind of car I drive. Look at my family. Look at my success. I'm okay. And that damns us because we never see our need of Christ. We think it's for somebody else. It's for the down and out and not the up and out. You've heard the message. You know what the message is. And Peter, I always hate reading this passage before lunch, but Peter says in 2 Peter 2, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, somebody comes to church, they hear the message, they hear the gospel, they hear the claims of Christ, they see the example of his life, and they say, Man, those people down there at the church, they just love people, and I want to be like that, and I want to love people, and... Jesus did so many good things and he talked about loving. And I want to do that. I want to quit doing what I'm doing and I want to be a good person. So I'm going to join that church and I'm going to be a good person and I'm going to do some good things. And they quit doing the things that they are doing and start doing some good things. Peter says if they hear the message and they understand it and they've turned away from the pollution of the world, then... They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now I'm self-righteous. Now I don't need to be saved. I'm doing better. See what I stopped doing? See what I'm doing now? Now I'm better. And you can only be better by yourself for so long. In your self-effort, 
and be better and be better and be better and be better. You know you can never be good enough, so you keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying, and eventually you give up. Peter goes on to say, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto men. Peter says it would be better for you not to even know than to know and reject it or to be self-righteous. But he says it happened unto them according to the true proverb, a dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallow, wallowing in the mire. You can come to church and you can change and you can do better and you can quit doing what you used to do, start doing something new, but without a change inwardly, you're going to wind up back where you were. And Peter gives us an illustration. Uh, from Proverbs about the dog and he adds the hog extra too. And let me just say here, and I know this, I'm gonna offend everybody today, I guess. Um, you can pretend if you want to, we'll just put it like this. You can pretend like your dog is a member of your family. And I, we used to have a dog and I loved our dog. And I thought a lot more of him than I did most people I knew. But he's a dog. And he'll go drink out of the toilet. He'll, as Proverbs and Peter says, he'll eat his own vomit. He's a dog. And you can clean him up and dress him up and put a bow on him and all that sort of stuff. But when you let him outside, he's a dog. And he's going to do what dogs do. The same illustration is true with a pig. You can dress him up like Charlotte's Web and take him to the fair, but when you get him back to the farm, he's going to get out in the mud. And you can change outwardly and try to put on a facade that you're different, but until Christ changes your heart, if you'll forgive me, you're just a dog and a hog. And Jesus said the danger in Reformation is you quit one habit and you pick up seven worse than you used to have. And the last state is worse than the first. The danger of Reformation. Secondly, the deception of relations. Jesus is teaching and preaching. And while he was preaching... His family comes. His mother, well, we don't know his mother's, his mother specifically. I believe she did know him. She still needed a savior. She said in her, whatever they call that prayer, she prayed. Her praise after she found out she was going to have the Lord. I'm grateful. I thank God my savior Mary needed to be saved as much as I do, as much as you do, as much as anybody does. But Jesus' family didn't believe him, didn't believe who he was, or at least his brothers and his sisters didn't. In fact, his brothers came to him and said, if you'll forgive my inelegant translation, he's preaching up in Galilee, up in the country. And his brothers come to him and say, Hey, man, you, I mean, you're doing miracles and you're preaching. And if, if you was really a preacher, you'd go to Jerusalem. You'd get down there to the city where everybody could see you. In John 7. And John, as he did, gives us a commentary. Because they didn't believe who he was. Later, well, he had brothers and sisters, Matthew 13 tells us. They said, after Jesus teaches them parables, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother and his brother and sisters living here still with us? How does he know all of these things? His family did eventually believe on him after the resurrection. Um, 
in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says that Mary and his brothers, his family, were there with the disciples in one accord. James became the leader of the Jerusalem church. Most believe that's James, the Lord's brother, because James, the disciple, Herod killed. And even Jude, the little book of Jude at the end of the, right before Revelation, uh, a lot of people believe that's one of the brothers. It mentions Judas as one of the brothers, and he starts his epistle with Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. He didn't even acknowledge the brother of Christ, but the brother of James. It's not that our earthly relations are unimportant, but it's not the main thing, and Jesus cared for his family. But they came to him, and if you can imagine, if you can imagine me, and I would love for this to happen just because I hadn't seen my mother in eight, nine years now. Can you imagine me being up here preaching and somebody comes up and says, hey, your mama wants to talk to you outside just a minute. That'd be just a little bit embarrassing, wouldn't it? I'm trying to present the message of the gospel. I'm trying to present the message of the kingdom. Hey, your mom's outside. Sometimes we can have more difficulty with our family than we do with others. The Darlins were over at Andy Griffiths. And Opie had got a little older and he had sung and he was... It was time for him to go to bed, and Andy got up to take him to bed, and Opie says, Oh, is it all right if I don't kiss you since we got company tonight? Sometimes our families can be an embarrassment to us, but not Jesus. They may have been seeking him, Mark's gospel tells us, and it sort of fits the picture. Mark says when Jesus' friends heard him speaking, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he's beside himself. Jesus is teaching, and the Pharisees are rejecting him. And, well, the Pharisees in verse 14 of chapter 12 said the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were trying to kill him. And so we don't know, and you can picture this, Jesus' family is outside and he's preaching and he's preaching some very radical stuff. And the family's outside saying, hey, can you go in there and get him? He really don't know what he's saying and we need to take him home. That's what Mark said. His family and friends tried to come to him and get him and take him away because they said he's gone crazy. He's really lost it. And not only has he really lost it, but these people are going to kill him. We need to try to get him out of here. And Jesus said, these are my family. My family is, are these people the ones who believe in me? Jesus did care for his family. He asked John to care for his mother, even at the cross. So, there's a danger in Reformation, in just change for change's sake. There's a deception in relations. Who is my family? But then there's the decision of redemption. Jesus stretched out his arms toward the crowd that was in the house. And he said, Behold, my mother and brothers are here. They're the ones who are really Jesus' family. The ones who believed him. We talked about this last time when Jesus fed the 5,000 in John's Gospel, chapter 6. The crowd followed him around the lake and got there. When did you get here? And they said, what, what can we do that we could work the works of God? And Jesus said, the work of God is that you believe on him whom he hath sent. That you believe in me. It's not those who are physically related to Christ, who are his family. It's those who believe. 
And then finally, as only Jesus could do, he ends with an invitation. It's not being better. It's not just turning over a new leaf. It's not my physical family, but it's those who believe. And then he says in verse 50, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Jesus gives, and I'm so grateful, a whosoever will invitation. Jesus said in chapter 11, Come unto me, how many? All, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will rest you. Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And then Jesus gives them a story in Matthew chapter 18. If a man had a hundred sheep and one of them had left, would he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seek the one that's gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more than of that sheep than the, of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it's not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Paul says in 1 Timothy, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And Peter tells us it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whosoever will may come. And the invitation is for us to hear him, to know him. Jesus was identified at his baptism. God spoke, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then at the Mount of Transfiguration, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Hear him. So we need to know him. We need to listen to him. But we need to obey him. Matthew 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but the one who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. There's no way of salvation, Peter and John said. There's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. The Pharisees were, in, well, if we lived and saw the Pharisees, we would call them good. But Reformation, moral and ethical change, is not good enough. Jesus said, and well, the Pharisees were a good bunch. Like I say, if we saw them, we would think, man, those people are really good. Remember the Pharisees' prayer in Luke 18? I tithe of everything I have. I fast twice a week. I mean, look how good I am. And outwardly they were. But Jesus said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll know by no way enter in. So, outward goodness is good, but it's not good enough. Family is good, but it's not good enough. Have you ever witnessed somebody try to share the gospel with somebody ask somebody if they're a Christian we know my daddy was a preacher you know my family helped start that church down there I've been out to witness the people in this community (laughs) this has been a while back I think I've been here five or six years hey we're from the church down here at Pleasant Side we'd like to invite you to come to church well I'm, I'm a member down there uh, do you know who the preacher is now? I said, yeah, I know. You know, my family helped start that church. All of that is good, but it's not good enough. It's not good enough. Only 
your decision for Christ matters. And not just a decision, not just to say, Lord, Lord, but Jesus said in verse 50, Whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The Pharisees had asked for a sign from heaven. Jesus said, if you do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. It's not just a decision, but it's surrendering our life to Christ. It's not external reform that we need. It's not earthly relations that we need. But it's an internal response to Christ. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my mother and brother and sister. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that it is whosoever believes, whosoever comes, whosoever obeys, whoever's faith is real, that truly trust you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would deliver us from our self-righteousness, our turning over a new leaf, our doing better. Forgive us for our self-righteousness. Help us to turn to you. Forgive us for our family religion that doesn't change us. Help us to truly surrender ourselves to you that we might be your mother and sisters and brothers. Your word says that you're not ashamed to call us brothers. It's hard for us to imagine that you love us so much that you came to give yourself a ransom for our sin and give us the righteousness which we can never attain. Lord, help us today to surrender ourselves anything that we hold to that we would claim for righteousness for ourselves, that we would denounce, turn away from, and come only to you and seek to do your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. We have our hymn of invitation. If you have a decision that you need to make, would you come as we stand and sing? Number 305.